Welcome. Today we look at 1.4, Consequences of Completeness. We see four great qualities of the real numbers. We will see the nested interval property, the Archimedean property, the density of the rationals in the reals, and the existence of square roots. Let's go. First up, the nested interval property. Here's the idea. Suppose I have infinitely many nested intervals. So here's the idea. Here's our first one. Uh, it starts with a1 at the left and b1 at the right. So there's a closed interval. Closed interval means it contains its two endpoints. So our first biggest interval goes from a1 on the left to b1 on the right. Then inside of that is our next interval, a2 on the left and b2 on the right. So that second interval is nested inside the first, and you go inside of that. There's an interval that has a3 on the left, b3 on the right, and you go inside and on and on and on forever and ever and ever. Suppose you had infinitely many nested intervals like this. The claim is that the intersection of all of these things is not empty. In other words, there is some real number x that will live in every interval. All right, let's see how this proof works. Oh, and by the way, this isn't true of the rational numbers. Suppose, for, exa for example, that somewhere in the middle of this, there was a little hole. And perhaps these intervals got nested closer and closer and closer to that hole, kind of like the square root of 2. If I was only in the rationals and I was zeroing in towards the square root of 2, ultimately I'd end up with nothing. But this is a completeness property, uh, this nested interval property. It shows us that there are no holes in the real numbers. Okay, let's see why this is so. For each natural number n, suppose that interval i sub n is a closed interval, and i1 contains i2, contains i3, contains on and on and on forever. Then the intersection of all these intervals is not empty. There's the statement. So how about a proof for this thing? What do we do? Well, first of all, let's write interval i sub n as the closed interval with left endpoint a sub n, right endpoint b sub n, like in the picture there. Consider all the left endpoints. So capital A is going to be the set of all those left endpoints, a1, a2, a3. Now, a, the set a is bounded above. And in fact, if you think about it, it's bounded above by any b sub i. This is a really important fact, the, the fact that any b sub i is an upper bound for the entire set A. Uh, and it's worth thinking about, just to convince yourself. I'll not go into any more details about this, but uh, yeah, make sure you can convince yourself that's true. Okay, so that's our situation so far. Now, since A is bounded above, it has a least upper bound. It has a supremum. This is the axiom of completeness. So this is by AOC, by the axiom of completeness. Here's our claim. x is that element we seek. x is a real number that is an element of the intersection of the infinitely many intervals. All right, so let's see why that claim is true. All right, I've repeated some of the lines I've had up there so far. So here's my claim. x is in that infinite intersection. So consider any um, interval n in particular. So just pick, pick some n. Okay, it has a left endpoint a sub n, right endpoint b sub n. Now I claim that x is greater than or equal to that left endpoint a sub n. And why is that? So let me skip that just for a second. And I'll also claim that x is less than or equal to the right endpoint, the b sub n. And I can argue why that's so, or maybe you can see. And if that's so, then x has to be inside the interval i sub n. And since the n was chosen arbitrarily, x is actually in i sub n for all n. And that is it. That proves that x is in uh, the intersection of all of them. So <laughs> it only remains now to give these two justifications. Pause the video. See that you can understand the proof where it is right now, and see if you can fill in those two missing lines. Then unpause it when you are ready to see the answer. All right, here we go. Here's the answer. This first one, x is greater than or equal to a n since, well, 
x is an upper bound for a. x is defined as the least upper bound, so certainly it is an upper bound. And how about the second line? x is less than or equal to bn since, well, bn is an upper bound for the entire set a. And x is the least upper bound for the set a, so certainly x is less than or equal to bn. So with those two lines complete, that completes the proof. Our next big idea is the Archimedean property. And this is the kind of thing where it seems kind of obvious, uh, but it's just a nice useful fact that uh, we will use a lot. So number one, given any real number x, there's some natural number n such that n is greater than x. That seems like a property you would want in the real numbers. And given any real epsilon greater than zero, there is some natural number n so that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Maybe it's a little bit like the idea The part one of the theorem says I can make my natural numbers n arbitrarily large, and two says I can make my natural numbers so that 1 over n becomes arbitrarily small and positive. Let's prove number one. All right, assume for contradiction that there is some real x bigger than every natural number. This is such a weird thing to imagine, right? <laughs> Could there possibly be a real number x bigger than every natural number? Um, well, if that was so, then the natural numbers would be bounded because that x would act as an upper bound. So if the natural numbers are bounded, then it has a supremum. And so let alpha be that supposed supremum of the natural numbers. So alpha is some real number that's greater than or equal to all natural numbers. Now, alpha minus 1 is not an upper bound for the naturals uh, because alpha itself was assumed to be the least of the upper bounds. So alpha minus 1 can't be an upper bound. So what does that mean? That means there must be some natural number m, so that m is actually greater than alpha minus 1. Alpha minus 1 is less than m. Okay, now let's just add 1 to both sides. Alpha, then, would be less than m plus 1. And that's a contradiction, because m plus 1 is in the natural numbers, alpha is less than some natural number, but alpha was supposed to be my least upper bound for the natural numbers, so contradiction. Can't happen. Part number 2 is pretty straightforward. Basically, just in part 1, replace the x with 1 over epsilon. So I'll leave that to you to kind of work out some of the details, but it follows as a straightforward application of part 1. So that's the Archimedean property. Our third great property of the real numbers is the density of the rationals in the reals. And here's what it means for the rationals to be dense in the reals. For every two real numbers, a and b, with a less than b, so I'm looking at my picture there, I've got the real number line, there are two real numbers, a and b, a less than b, there exists a rational number, r, such that the rational number is strictly between a and b. So that's the role that m over n is playing in that picture. So given any two real numbers with a less than b, there's some rational number strictly between them. That's what it means for the rationals to be dense in the reals. So how does the proof for this go? Here's the idea. Two things. One, find a natural number n big enough so that 1 over n is less than the difference b minus a. That difference b minus a, that's the width between uh, the two real numbers, a and b. So that's b minus a. That's that width. So if I can make my 1 over n, here we go on the left, 1 over n, I want to make that width less than the width between a and b. Then I find an integer m so that a is less than m over n, less than b. Basically, I'm taking m multiples of 1 over n. I'm stepping, 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 and eventually I will step into the gap between a and b without accidentally stepping over it. I won't be able to step over the gap because my 1 over n is small enough. All right, so that's the idea. That's the kind of the, the big structure of the proof. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get into some of the details. By the Archimedean property 2, 
there is a natural number n large enough so that 1 over n is less than b minus a. So uh, part number one of our strategy is taken care of immediately by Archimedean property number two. I can do that. There is such a natural number n. So that means 1 by, by multiplying through by n. So 1 is less than bn minus an. Or just a little algebra here, an plus 1 is less than bn. All right, so consider this expression. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. On the next page, I'm sort of shifting things up a little bit, but uh, I've just repeated what I had before. There is the statement I ended with, an plus 1 is less than bn. And I'm going to label this as a number 1, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Different thought. Pick the least m in my natural numbers so that an is less than m. So I have this real number an, and by my Archimedean property 1, I know that there's a natural number big enough that gets bigger than that real number. So in fact, pick the least m such that m is greater than a n. All right, well, there's an interesting consequence of that. If m is the least thing, the least natural number that's greater than a n, then m is less than or equal to a n plus 1. Can you see why that's so? Just a little kind of thought experiment for contradiction. Just If it just happened that m was greater than a n plus 1, then I could subtract 1 from both sides m minus 1 would be greater than a n. Oh, and then I'd have a, a natural number, a natural number smaller than m that was still greater than a n, and that would contradict my choice of m before. Uh, so, uh, no, that can't happen. So definitely m is less than or equal to a n plus 1. Oh, but in fact, a n plus 1, we saw that expression earlier, up above there. And by labeled uh, statement number one, uh, a n plus one is less than b n. So let's call that three. <laughs> now put together two and three, these two statements here. And we find by, problem, uh, by statement two, a n is less than m. And by statement three, m is less than b n. And that basically, that takes us one step away from where we need to be, right? Because what's my last step now? Let's divide everything through by n. And there we go. A is less than m over n is less than b. I found my rational number, m over n, that is strictly between the two given real numbers. All right, so the rational numbers are dense in the real numbers. Interestingly, by the way, corollary 1.4.4, given any two real numbers a less than b, there is an irrational number t with uh, a less than t less than b. So I guess you could say the irrational numbers are also dense in the real numbers. And this brings us to the existence of square roots. By the axiom of completeness, this set t the set of all uh, all real numbers where t squared is less than 2, this has a supremum alpha. We claim that alpha squared equals 2. Now, on our first day of class, maybe even the first and second days of class, we've used this notation, square root of 2. We've talked about the square root of 2. Um, we were a little bit fast and loose with it, to be honest. We never really proved that there existed such a number whose square is 2. So we'll do that now. This set has a supremum, and I claim that the supremum has the quality that alpha squared equals 2, and that shows the existence of the square root of 2. Alpha is that square root of 2 that I seek. Proof. Here's, here's the strategy of the proof. First, I will assume that a, alpha squared is less than 2, and I'll come up with a contradiction. Then I will assume that alpha squared is greater than 2, and I'll come up with a contradiction again. And then at the end of that, I'll have to conclude that, in fact, alpha squared actually equals 2. So we're looking for contradictions. Okay, assume that alpha squared is less than 2. Ah, Archimedean property number 2. So I can choose n large enough so that 1 over n is less than this positive number. And just take a second. Is this really a positive number? Uh, by my assumption, alpha squared is less than 2, so that's positive. 
and 2 alpha plus 1, alpha is positive for sure, uh, so 2 alpha plus 1 is positive, yeah, so that fraction is positive, and um, the Archimedean property number 2 applies. So multiply both sides by that denominator, 2 alpha plus 1 over n is less than 2 minus alpha squared. And now sort of pause that thought for a second, and then just consider this new expression, alpha plus 1 over n squared. All right. Now, by the way, why in the world are we doing this? We are not motivated at all to consider this expression, uh, alpha plus 1 over n squared. This is the idea in proof writing, where whoever first wrote this proof did a lot of scratch work, and they finally figured out how to prove it, and then they cleaned up all their scratch work, and they provided a nice, straightforward way of giving us the proof, but we don't really see where we're going, but it'll kind of, the answer will sort of pop out at the end like magic, and we'll say, isn't that clever? Weren't they, weren't they great to think of that thing? Okay, so because the author is telling us, just let's consider consider alpha plus 1 over n squared. And let's see where that leads us. Well, I use FOIL. I will expand that out. I get alpha squared plus 2 alpha over n plus 1 over n squared. Notice that that's less than or equal to alpha squared plus 2 alpha over n plus 1 over n. The only difference, I've changed the n squared into n. So if I'm making my denominator smaller, it makes the fraction bigger, so it makes this whole expression bigger. The only time we might get equals if, is if n actually equals 1. So at this point, I can add the second two terms, uh, and that gives me uh, alpha squared plus uh, 2 alpha plus 1 over n. But we've seen this 2 alpha plus 1 over n before, right here. 2 alpha plus 1 over n is less than 2 minus alpha squared. Ah, so this whole expression is less than alpha plus 2 minus alpha squared, and that equals 2. Okay, but uh, so uh, why are we considering this particular expression? Because now look at the very beginning and the very end of uh, this expression. I have alpha plus 1 over n squared is less than 2. Thus, alpha plus 1 over n is an element of t, right? t is the set of all real numbers whose square is less than 2. Thus, alpha is not an upper bound for t, and we have a contradiction. How about the other way? Assume alpha squared is greater than 2. Well, I am not going to go through this in full detail. It's very similar. Uh, choose n large enough so that 1 over n is less than this quantity. Uh, that's Archimedean property number 2. Uh, we do a little bit of arithmetic. We square alpha minus 1 over n, and we get some results. We do a little bit of arithmetic. We find that this is equal to 2. So looking at the beginning and the end, we have alpha minus 1 over n squared is greater than 2. And so this tells me that alpha minus 1 over n is an upper bound for my set t. And that's a contradiction, because alpha is the least upper bound. I can't have alpha minus 1 over n being an upper bound. Alpha was the least upper bound. So that's the contradiction that tells me alpha squared greater than 2 is false. That can't happen either. Thus, I'm left to conclude that alpha squared, in fact, equals 2. Alpha is that real number whose square is 2. It's the square root of 2. The square root of 2 exists. All right, and that finishes our 1.4 consequences of completeness. These are four pretty significant characteristics of the real numbers, and they all come about from the axiom of completeness.